that we are studying this passage in Matthew. We're kind of working our way through Matthew. And we're going to deal with a topic today um, that I'm sure you can relate to. And it's the topic of stubbornness. I want you to think of that word, stubborn. You may be sitting next to someone today that you would say, they are the definition of stubborn. Yeah. You no doubt all know someone today that is the definition of stubborn. Well, one day a man and a wife had given birth to their very first child, and it was a boy. They both were so stubborn that they couldn't decide on a name. This had gone on for months and months and months, and he would suggest a name, and she'd say, absolutely not. And he would, she, uh, he would suggest a name, she'd say, absolutely not. And so finally the nurse came in, and she said, folks, I have to have a name for the birth certificate. And being the stubborn parents that they were, they just sat there in silence. This silence went on for a long time until finally the father stood up and he said, well, this is odd. And so the nurse said, thank you. That's all that I needed. We're going to call him odd. Well, the young boy grew and as a child, of course, he was picked on and bullied because his name was Odd, and that started many fights and just many different things with having a name Odd. How could, could you imagine your name just being Odd? And so this young man turned into a man one day, and he got married, and he told his wife, he said, you know something, honey? He said, this name has plagued me my entire life. And he said, I want you to make me one promise, and that is when I die, do not put my name on my tombstone. Have the year that I was born and the year that I died, but do not put that name on on my tombstone and she granted him that wish because he never wanted to be known again by his name and so one day this elderly couple was walking through the cemetery and they come across this tombstone that has no name and the man looked at his wife and he said well that's odd <laughs> the point of telling you that is this stubbornness can lead to disaster in your life. In fact, when we read the Gospels, you will find that Jesus spoke some harsh words on occasion, did he not? And sometimes we make the mistake of assuming these words are intended for them and not us. I have witnessed this firsthand this week. There's a college, a university, Asbury University, that is having um, what some would call a revival, some would call awakening. There's all different kinds of things that uh, people are calling this, and no doubt pastors of all people are the first to step in and say whether this is a move of God or whether this is not a move of God. And Christians have stood up, and they've all given their input on this. And in fact, I was even asked, I wondered if I would be asked this question today, and I was even asked this question um, during Sunday school. And... As I thought about that, I thought, you know, we as Christian people can become so stubborn and so set in our ways that if people do not do things exactly the way that we do them, we would just mark it off and we will say, nope, it's not my way, so it's not right. Now, the Bible is always our guide to give us direction in any situation, and the Bible is what we should be judged by. And the Bible is what things like that should be judged by. But I have not been there. I've only heard stories, the good and the bad. And to my knowledge, you have not been there. And so what that means is we just have to put our spiritual stubbornness aside and leave our opinions to ourselves because we don't necessarily know what's going on. And this passage today, I thought, would be perfect for all of social media and all of the world and just everyone to be able to hear. Because when Jesus spoke these words, I feel like he was speaking to everyone today. And we have that uh, something among us that wants to refer to the words that Jesus speaks here as, yes, this message is to them, rather than looking at a passage like this and saying this message is to us. The truth is, when Jesus speaks, can you agree we need to hear his words? It's not just for them. A message is also for us. And one of the conversations that Jesus had 
in this passage was about stubbornness. Now, I said jokingly earlier, you may be sitting next to someone that's stubborn, and I would ask the question, do you know someone that's stubborn? But let me ask you a a more personal question. Would people look at you and say that you are stubborn? What about primarily spiritually? Could people look at you and say, spiritually speaking, you are very stubborn? You know, there is a certain quality I have seen more often in church members than non-believers, and that quality is described as what I'm talking to you about today, spiritual stubbornness. Christians that are just simply spiritually stubborn. And you know what spiritual stubbornness does to you and I as a believer? It holds us back. It prevents us from being close to God. It prevents us from truly, honestly fulfilling everything that God wants us to do in our life because spiritual stubbornness in the life of a Christian will imprison us and it will limit the work that we do for the Lord. Why? Because it causes our hearts to turn cold. It causes us to be distant. It causes us to turn a deaf ear to the voice of God. And I I so often wonder if God would speak today, how many Christians would really understand that that is God that's speaking to them. I mean, if they cannot discern the Holy Spirit, then certainly they could not discern the voice of God because God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit are all three the same, and they're all one. So a spiritually stubborn Christian is not going to be effective, just like a spiritually stubborn church is no longer going to be effective. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to look at this passage that we have read together today and ask ourselves the question, what does Jesus say about being spiritually stubborn? And more importantly, how can we avoid it? Because when we leave here today, we need to make sure that we fall on the side that says, I am not identifying myself as someone that is spiritually stubborn. Go back to chapter 11 of Matthew because this is where the passage picks up. And I want to read some of this to you again, just so you hear it in your mind time and time again and understand the teachings that Jesus is giving us here. In verse 16 of our text, I want you to hear what the Lord says. He says, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? Now, that is as if Jesus is standing here and he's looking at us and he's saying, what could I say about your generation today? The time that you are actually living in right now. What would I say about you? Well, let's hear what Jesus had to say. To them, he said, it is likened unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows or their friends or playing with their friends, verse 17, and saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath a devil. The son of man come eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publican and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Now what do we make of that? What's the overarching point that Jesus is wanting us to see as he's talking to that generation? But very well, he could speak, speak the same message and speak to our generation as well. Well, he gives us some characteristics of spiritual stubbornness. And as I give you these characteristics today, I hope you will use this as a checklist in your life and say, does this describe me? Well, here's how we will find out, and let's get right into them. And here they are. Number one, I want you to write this down. Someone that is spiritually stubborn has a critical attitude. Critical attitude. They're critical about everything. They always have to have something to say. Now, come on, church, you know as well as I do, none of us like being around those types of people. They have the answer for everything. You cannot mention anything without them giving you their opinion about the matter. People like that, the only pastoral way I know how to say it is they drive me absolutely insane. They make me want to pull my hair out. Well, that could be what's happened most of my life, I guess. But they have a critical attitude about them. Now, what does that have to do with the passage that we're reading today? Well, Jesus talks to that generation about the marketplace that was there. And the marketplace 
that Jesus mentioned here was an area where people would come to and they would commerce, they would do business, but they would also socialize. And I love to read church history and ancient documents because here's what it tells us that would happen whenever the parents would go out and they would go to a a, a place like this and the parents would be shopping, the children would stop and the children would always be playing. It was a, a perfect picture of what you would see whenever children get together. And with that being the case, in that day and time, they had two primary, primary games that they would play, children would play in that day. One is the wedding game. And the wedding game just simply consisted of the fact that children would pretend they, would get, they were getting married and they would have this festive music and everybody would be dancing and everybody loves a good wedding, right? There's a lot of fun to that. And so that was a game that they would play in the marketplace and the children, Jesus is saying, would be playing that game. But another game that they would play in Jewish society would be the funeral game, kind of the game we're playing today. Everyone looks sad and you know, everybody's just kind of staring at each other and it's, it's the typical game you would see played today. But as these kids were out there and they're playing one of these two games, Jesus said, I want you to learn something from these children. And it's always amazing to me that Jesus always had to teach us something anytime children were involved. And he's saying that some of these children, when they would play games, would choose not to play the game and they would go and do their own thing. And so Jesus was telling that generation, you are acting just like these children. You're saying, I don't want to play that game. I want to play my own game. And in essence, Jesus is calling them out and pointing them back to those little children and the childish games that they play. How do we know that? Because he makes reference here to John the Baptist. And he says in our passage here, John the Baptist neither ate nor drunk, but you all said that he had a demon. And Jesus said, I, the son of man, come on the scene and I'm eating and drinking and doing the things that the society does here. And you are calling me a drunkard and a glutton. And so Jesus Jesus pointed to his listeners and he said to them, you're just critical. You're critical of everyone in your life. And and that's the point that he is, is making here. And by the way, I want to give you a very important truth. There are people in your life that will find anything they can to criticize you for. That's just the world that we live in. Some people are just critical. They never see the good in anything. The world has them. Your employer has them. Our church has them. Your family has them. We all know them. There are some people that will criticize anything that you do. But do you know what I have noticed about those critics? I've noticed that criticism that they make are based on exaggerations and deceptions. They're not based on truth. Because critics always like to have a good story to talk about. I mean, here's John the Baptist. This man lived a simple life. Scripture tells us that he ate locusts and he ate wild honey. And he lived out in the desert. And his critics come to him and because of that, what did they say? They could only see the worst in him and they said, John the Baptist has a demon. Jesus, he ate and he drank in the same manner of all the first century Jews there. And his critics exaggerated what Jesus was doing, and they said, he's a drunkard, he's a glutton. He should not be doing these things. And by the way, I'm just telling you, that's what critics do. They criticize. They're always critical of everything. And so they will always stretch the truth to make their point, and that's what they did in this passage today that we're reading. They always stretch the truth just to make their point. They exaggerated. They fabricated. Why? Because critics are not interested in the truth. Critics are interested in just having an argument. And that's why we as Christians have to make sure that when we have people in our life, we understand they either want to be a critic or they want to know the truth. If someone doesn't want to know the truth, you can argue till you're blue in the face with them, and it's not going to change a thing at all. We have to make sure that they want to know the truth. And so why am I telling you all that? Because a critical attitude leads to what we're talking about today, and that is spiritual stubbornness. The, I guess you could say, the inability to recognize what God is actually doing in your own life. 
Now, the question is, how do we avoid this? Because I assume none of you want to be known as that critical, stubborn Christian. Well, let me give you a couple things, three very quick things here. First of all, and jot this down, you have to avoid pettiness. Much of the things that we face on a daily basis is nothing more than pettiness. And, of course, it's the message that Jesus is giving them here. Secondly, you have to make sure that you know what you're talking about. Now, can we be real transparent for a moment? Wouldn't you like to look at just people sometimes and say, you have no idea what you're talking about. You don't have, I know you think you're smart and I know you think you have all the answers and I know you think you're fluent and you think all this stuff. But let me tell you something, you don't know, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. There's a third thing for us to keep in mind. That's try doing what you're criticizing. You know, it's kind of like the Monday morning quarterback thing. You can sit and watch a football game or a basketball game, and the people that's watching it, they're always the experts. It's not the athletes that are the experts. It's the people watching the game that are the experts. They know what they should have done and what they should be doing, but they're not the ones that's actually in the game. And so if we try doing what we're criticizing, sometimes maybe that will help us not to be so critical. And so... First of all, Jesus talks to them about their critical attitude. But there's a second thing that I want to give you today, and that is an apathetic attitude. That's a warning that we must heed, not to have that apathetic attitude. It's one thing to have a critical attitude. It's a whole other thing to have an apathetic attitude. Go back to verse 20 of our text and listen to the words that Jesus speaks here in Matthew chapter 11. It says, then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, but they repented not. That's an important uh, section of that passage, but they repented not. In verse 21, Jesus says, but woe unto the Coherzin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if thy mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Those are damning words that Jesus is speaking. And in verse 23, he says, and thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Jesus concludes by saying, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now that is saying something since God destroyed an entire city because of homosexuality. That is amazing. And, God, and Jesus says, it would be more tolerable for them than for you that had me in your sight and just chose not to believe and chose not to accept me, and chose not to live for me. See, that would explain our generation today. We have the revealed word of God right in front of us. The world chooses not to accept it. But I admit, those are strong words, aren't they? I want you to notice something here. The cities that Jesus mentions here didn't take any violent action against Jesus. They didn't have a rebellion. They didn't come with with uh, weapons, what did they do? They just ignored him. They pretend he didn't exist or pretended that he was someone else. And is not that what our world is doing today when it comes to Christ? Well, we don't have a problem if you want to believe in Jesus, but don't expect us to believe in Jesus. Don't expect us to believe that he's God. So you see the first characteristic of spiritual stubbornness is a critical attitude. An attitude that criticizes everything that could be spiritual. Secondly, it's an apathetic attitude. It's an attitude that says, I just don't even care. Finally, this morning, we look thirdly at a prideful attitude. And I want you to notice, if you would, in verse 25 of our text here, as we talk about a prideful attitude. Jesus says this in 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. 
Even so, Father, he says, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now, I think you have just a touch of sarcasm here as Jesus is praying that prayer. As his words refers to uh, the wise, the, the prudent, I guess you would say. But this applies to some Christians today. Because you will have people in our generation, in our time, and they will read book after book, and they will be able to debate, and they will talk about all these doctrinal nuances uh, that they have, and they're actually not doing anything for the kingdom of God. All they're doing is sitting back and criticizing what, everything else, what everyone else is doing. You know, do you want to know why I think a lot of these Baptist preachers have spoke out against this, uh, whatever this thing is that's going on at Asbury? And I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm just saying the reason I really truly feel a lot of Baptist preachers are speaking out against it is because they're jealous it's not happening where they're at. So it's a lot easier just to criticize and to say that can't be real because it's not happening here rather than saying thank you, God, for whatever you're doing, and I pray that somebody is touched as a result of this. Now, we know that wherever God is working, Satan is going to be working overtime. But I also know this. I have a hard enough time keeping my own ship selling, let alone worrying about the rest of the world. I have a hard enough time in my own Jerusalem, let alone what, worrying about what every other preacher is doing in the nation. And so I think it really comes down to this, to prevent us from being spiritually stubborn and our criticizing others and just being complacent with who Jesus is, I think it comes down to when we get involved in serving, it changes our entire perspective on the Christian life. Instead of being critical of others, let's learn to be supportive in their walk with God. Instead of being apathetic, let's learn to be compassionate. Instead of being proud, let's learn to be humble. And in serving others, I think we will become more like Jesus than we ever have before. And so this is my prayer for you today, that you would truly have a fire that burns in you that says, not only do I want to live right, but I want those that are around me to live right. And I want to do my part in helping build the kingdom of God. I want to do my part in helping this local church even grow. I want to do my part in staying on the right track. That's my encouragement to you today because all of us need to do that. But we need to make a commitment Am I right in saying, you've heard me say it probably weekly, the world around us has gone mad. The world around us is going crazy. Anybody want to jump in the Ohio River this afternoon, take a swim, and just assume that, you know, the EPA's right about everything. Nothing's come down our way. Waters are totally clean. I'm sure none of you, you look at that and you think, what in the world is going on in our world today? Go dip you a big old gallon of water and make you some sweet tea out of the Ohio River this afternoon. Let's see how much faith you really have. Listen, I'm not going to get so confused and focused about all the stuff that's going on in the world because here's what I found. It puts me in a bad mood. It affects my relationship with God, and what I have to focus on is Jesus is Lord. He's, he is King of kings, and he's coming back, and when he comes back, I want to be ready so he looks at me and he can say, you know, I was really pleased with the way that you lived your Christian life. I gave you this much time in the realm of eternity, and you did the very best that you could do with it. And church, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not saying we should whitewash sin and all of that. I've already said the Word of God is our judge on all things. But if it don't concern us, then how was it that people used to say it, I guess, in a nice way? Mind your own business? Is that, is that too harsh for any of you? Mind your own business. Stay in your own lane. I guess there's all kinds of ways that we could say that today. Take care of, I heard one preacher say it this one time, draw a circle around yourself and say, God, let revival begin with me. Let me worry about me and let me get right with God and maybe others will see what you're doing in my life. And I want to encourage you not only as a Christian, but I want to encourage us as a church to do exactly draw a circle around ourselves and say, God, let it begin in my life. Can you do that today? Let's stand together and go to the Lord's Prayer.
Lord, as I come to you today, I realize that we stand here and we stand here in a time in our world where, as I said, things are chaotic. We can't explain things that, that happen. There's no need for us to worry, Lord, because you know what's going on. You know the past, you know the present, you know the future. Lord, what we need to do is stay focused on our relationship with you and ask ourselves the question, am I closer to you today, God, than I was yesterday? And if not, Lord, help us to do something about that. Maybe we could ask the question this way, God. We could say, am I more faithful to you today than I've ever been in my life? And Lord, if the answer to that question is no, help us not to be critical and find all the reasons why we're not. Help us to examine our own life and say, God, let it begin with me. Lord, search my heart. Show me where I'm doing things. Show me the things in my life that you're not pleased with. God, I pray that you would help all of us today as we strive to do that. Lord, help us this morning to realize we are sinners and we are on a journey, <clears throat> and one day that journey will end up, no doubt, with death, and we'll be in heaven with you for eternity. But while we're here, I pray, God, that <clears throat> you would just help us to continue to keep pressing on. Help us to examine our hearts and our lives today. We ask this in Jesus' name.